All right, welcome back to the classroom. Uh, I'm Mr. Wong. Today we're going to be looking at uh, module eight from the universe to the atom. Inquiry question two: structure of the atom. What we're going to investigate is um, the models supporting the existence of electrons and looking at its certain properties by investigating some early experiments into cathode rays, uh, aka electrons. And we're also going to look at Thompson's charge to mass experiment. If this does go over about 20 minutes, uh, we will split this up into two sections, so two videos uh, for each dot point. Uh, so that's how we're going to tackle the issue. <clears throat> okay, so as I said again, uh, we're going to explore experiments used to identify the properties of the electron. Um, in this um, presentation, you'll hear me use the wording of cathode rays more often uh, than actual saying electrons, because at a certain point in time, um, cathode rays was the known uh, wording for the electrons. So electron, I'm going to interchangeably say cathode rays. Okay, so we're going to look at some characteristics uh, that gave us our idea that the electron is both negatively charged and also the fact that it is a particle. So what conclusions can we come up with uh, to give this idea now? Okay, so let's just start off with all the people who've kind of contributed. This is obviously a summarized version. There are a lot more other people involved. Um, back in about 400 BC, there was a guy, a Greek philosopher called Democritus, and he proposed the idea that um, there is a point where, imagine you have a piece of rock, and you try and smash that piece of rock into little bits. So you're trying to separate that piece of rock. He's saying at a certain point in time, as you keep smashing, 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 um, there comes a point where it can't be broken apart anymore. And so he came up with the idea of the indivisible item. So a certain object that cannot be broken down any further. And the name he actually gave this item was Atomos. So a particle that cannot be broken down anymore. And then we come to a guy called JJ Thompson. So this man over here. JJ Thompson came up with the idea of the electron, as you can see here. And mind you, the actual difference in time periods. J.J. Thompson did his discovery about in the late 1800s. There was another man before him that proved the concept of uh, elements of the periodic table in the name of Dalton. Um, slightly earlier than J.J. Thompson, but as you can see there is a massive gap of difference uh, to how we understand uh, atoms from his time to his time here. As a matter of fact, not many people believe in the concept of atoms or the elements. Um, it really started a lot later. Okay, now JJ Thompson had a student called Ernest Rutherford, and Rutherford discovered the concept of a positively dense nucleus, uh, also the proton. Um, he's also known as the father of uh, radiation, because he did a lot of stuff related to radiation as well, uh, radioactive decay. So Ernest Rutherford, and then he also had a student called James Chadwick, uh, and he was the one who did the experiments to discover the neutron. So we're not going to cover these two guys today, but we are going to look at what J.J. Thompson did uh, with the electron, and then in the following lessons we'll look at the proton and then the neutron. It's quite amazing here because uh, as I said before, each one after the other was actually a student or teacher kind of relationship. So, you know, a very smart bunch of people coming together. Okay, so 
How did J.J. Thompson discover the electron? We won't go over the specific details just yet, um, but I just want you to have a look at this little diagram here. So this is what we call a cathode ray tube. Um, so in a cathode ray tube, uh, it's essentially in a vacuum, so really low pressure. Uh, there's no air or virtually no air inside. Okay, so this is our cathode ray tube. And it's essentially in a vacuum. Okay. Uh, what we have here is two electrically charged plates, so two parallel charged plates. And if you see this circle here, that's actually the Holt, uh, Helmholtz coil. Uh, that actually generates the magnetic field. Okay, we have a cathode that's going to actually release the electrons. Um, the way it actually does that is this high voltage here uh, causes the cathode to heat up. And when the cathode is heated up, it's going to release these electrons. You also see the anode here. Um, remember cathode, negative end, anode, positive end. So the electrons are naturally uh, attracted to move towards the anode. Now, if I have a little slit or a little hole in between, this is going to accelerate the electron through the anode and into this charge plate and the coils here. And we kind of look at some interactions. Now, if we can manipulate how the electron kind of bends, sort of more like a curved power shape or just to allow it to move straight through and you can see some light at the end you can actually work out its velocity and charge to mass ratio but a bit more on that later okay so we're gonna talk about the actual concept of the cathode ray tube now originally they're known as Geisler tubes uh, invented by the German physicist uh, Heinrich Geisler um, basically a vacuum tube um, and using those tubes he could take it to 0.01% of normal air pressure and you can get these kind of effects here okay now you don't need to know in this particular section either this is actually part of the old syllabus but you know it gives you context now, depending on the type of air pressure you have in these Geisler tubes, you will see different types of patterns. Okay, we call these stratostation patterns. Um, basically, you can see all these dark and bright patterns here. All right, so the bright regions that you see here, these are where the electrons, so say this is from the cathode, uh, is interacting with the very small amount of atoms inside this tube here and causes excitation and if you remember uh, when we talked about emission spectra if you excite electrons that's going to cause uh, some production of light being formed here okay dark regions there's no excitations of electrons in the cathode you can see depending on the percentage of atmospheric pressure you can alternate and change the patterns essentially the lower the uh, air pressure, the less of a pattern you'll see, higher you'll see some of this. If you go too high, you won't see anything because uh, the electrons will be non interactable or difficult to interact with. Okay, you can watch this video, but we'll skip through that. So that's just showing the different types of patterns. Okay. So, the actual cathode ray tubes we're talking about was invented a little bit later. Um, and what we essentially do to it is we add two metal plates, the cathode and the anode. Now, remember what I said, the cathode is where we're releasing the electrons. You can see from the structure, the negative end is on this side. So, that's our negative end, that's our positive end. Okay, so the function of this is uh, 
as electricity goes through, that's going to cause the cathode to heat up and that, or you can even say that's the energy gap, that's the distance gap between the two electrodes. And remember, if the distance is close enough uh, between two charge plates, the gaps, that will allow the electron to move from the cathode to the anode. Okay. If it's really low air pressure, um, we can cause the end of the anode to glow because that's the electrons interacting with the atoms. Okay. So overall, this is the basic structure of the cathode rays before we get into the experiments we do. You do need a really high voltage, about 20, uh, 20, um, 20,000 Kelvin. Okay. When we talk about cathode rays, we actually mean the electrons. Um, the reason why we call them cathode rays is, as you would know, it's coming from the cathode. Uh, to actually see the patterns, you need to reduce the air pressure to a very, very small percentage. And cathode is negative, anode is positive, and that's also where you see the glow or the fluorescence. In chemistry, um, cathode and anode is actually swapped around, but in physics, cathode is positive, anode is uh, cathode is negative, anode is positive. Okay, so now the debate comes. What type of nature do cathode rays have? Are they particles or are they waves? So we're going to look at a couple of experiments. We'll show you a couple of animations, and we're going to try and work out uh, which one is more logical. Okay, so this is the first stop point we're covering, early experiments examining the nature of cathode rays. Okay, this we already talked about, how do cathode rays work? Um, at higher air pressures, uh, so when we have maybe, let's say, 99% um, of air inside, electrons will collide with the air molecule, hence no rays are observed. So... The fact that you see these rays here, that's the obviously the electrons coming through. Um, and that's the beam of electrons coming through. That's how you actually see the actual cathode ray. Okay? All right, so which directions do the cathode rays move? Well, um, an inventor once made the bent Geisler tube. Um, we had the cathode end and we had the anode end. If you actually have a look at this diagram, obviously there's an intense glow, that's the fluorescence. Um, what we can say from here is the fact that we see a glow, um, not at the anode, but just directly straight path of where the cathode is moving, or the electrons are moving away from the cathode, this bit here, that would imply that cathode rays move in straight lines. Another thing we can also say is the fact that the glow is coming from here, then it should imply that the um, electrons are coming from the cathode, hence we call them cathode rays. So the experiments we're going to look at is the Maltese cross, magnetic fields, paddle wheel, electric fields, and fluorescence. We're going to see how all these five different experiments come together to show the specific nature of cathode rays, aka electrons. So the Maltese cross, the question that we can actually answer with the Maltese cross is which direction is the rays moving? And um, would we get a shadow? Okay, would we get a sharp shadow? So if you have a look at this diagram or this animation here, when we have the cross on, oh, just disappeared. Uh, but when we have the Maltese cross on, we get fluorescence on this side here. Now, this side is actually the cathode, this side is the anode. You'll just have to take my word for it because no diagrams in this one. You can see the glow is occurring at the anode, which means that as the glow is from the anode, it means uh, the electrons are originated from the cathode, okay? So that tells us, in terms of direction, it goes from cathode to anode. If we then have a look, we can see it. there is a shadow forming. So the question is, do we get sharp lines or do we get uh, blurry lines? Remember, the implication is, if we get blurry lines, 
it means it's a wave, okay? Because there is interference patterns occurring here. If we get sharp lines, we're getting particles, okay? Because particles, to our understanding at that point, don't diffract. If you actually have a look at the Maltese cross here, we get a really sharp shadow. So the Maltese cross here would imply that particle nature there. Okay? So that's just covering what we see here. Okay? Some justification. So given that the cathode rays travel in straight lines and form the sharp shadow, that would imply we have a particle nature. Okay? So there's that. We also know that it derived, came from the cathode, from this shadow, so that's why we came up with the name of cathode rays. Okay, you can have a watch of this video if you want. Uh, links will be included in the um, information section. Next, we're going to look at magnetic fields and cathode rays. Now, remember this uh, electromagnetic waves. They are propagated by electric fields and alternating magnetic fields as well, okay? Now, what we do know is waves do not interact with magnetic fields, okay? So what you can see here in these two diagrams, the fact that our cathode ray is being bent in multiple directions would imply particle, okay? So... If you actually have a look at this diagram that we have here, change it. And for those who forgot how to use their right hand palm rule, this is a perfect time to test it out. So from observations, we can see, or from these observations we see here, you can see the magnet there, you can see the magnet there. The cathode ray bends perpendicular to the magnetic fields. You can see the magnetic fields coming here coming through and the magnetic field is bending uh, upwards in that particular scenario so coming through here and then it bends up okay so justification the fact that we are getting some interaction with magnetic fields implies it's charged particles or the um, cathode rate is charged we can also test out whether it's negatively charged or positively charged so Using your right hand grip rule, or palm rule, sorry, um, let's try and paint it out. Now, we know it's coming out from the cathode, so the direction of the current is going in the right hand side, or to the right hand side, okay? So if we use our right hand uh, palm rule, thumb pointing to the right, we know that the north pole is going from bottom to up, or s some along the lines there. So our fingers are going sort of into the page. So our B field is in page. So thumb pointing to the right, fingers pointing into the page. You'll see that your palm should be pointing upwards, okay? But remember, your th right thumb indicates a positive charge, okay? So if I use my left hand, my left thumb indicates a negative charge, and I do the exact same thing. So left thumb to the right, fingers into the page, my left palm is pointing down. Okay, so left palm is pointing down. So that implies that we are dealing with a negative charge. That's one way of showing. Obviously, that wasn't how they actually did it. Um, or it's a way of indicating, but we still need more proof. Okay, we still need more proof on that. Okay, uh, just before we quickly go through, let's just have a look at this multiple choice question. So which of the following diagram correctly depicts electric fields between point charges or charged particles, okay? Um, the correct answer here is D, okay? So we know that electric fields go from positive charge to negative charge. Here we have the negative charge go positive, so that's incorrect. 
Two positive charges, um, as we said, goes away from a positive charge for an electric field. So the field line should be going the opposite direction. Again, this has the same mistake as A, so D is the correct answer here. Okay, the next one we have is the paddle wheel. Okay, so what you can see here, we are discharging electrons uh, into the paddle. And we are going to try and push this paddle to spin. You can see that spinning effect going on here. Okay. So what does that imply? If I have these electron beams coming through, they're trying to move from here to here. And we see that the paddle wheel is progressively moving further and further to the right. So what we've actually done is we've caused rotation. Okay, so we've created movement. So the only way, so the fact that we created movement cause rotation, causing rotation, movement, implies that we've given the paddle wheel some kind of velocity, which implies that we've given it momentum. Now, if you recall, momentum is lowercase p equals mass times velocity. Now, mass is a particle in nature, or at least that's what we thought of at that point there. So if something is a particle, it should have mass. Radiation waves are predicted to have no mass. So this paddle wheel, the fact that it rotates would imply momentum, which implies particle nature of the cathode ray. Okay, so you can actually see this rotating along, and uh, as it rotates, it gains more momentum to spin faster. It's moving, it's moving, and rotating like so. Again, in the links, next one we have is fluorescence. Now, fluorescence is a different one. So this is where we start getting a little bit of uh, contradictions with uh, what we expect the nature of these catharades or electrons to be. So this beam here, so the actual fluorescence is this little screen back here, okay? Now we know that ultraviolet light um, is known to be able to cause things to fluoresce, so ultraviolet light. Now this beam here is not ultraviolet light, it's still the cathode rays. The fact that we can get fluorescence uh, would imply that there is a, a wave nature involved. Okay, what do I mean by fluorescence? Um, as you can see, this glow, it's also implied in the uh, crime solving, you know, movies and all that, where they use UV light to look at blood stains. that's fluorescence. So these electrons or cathode rays also do that. There's your, uh, you know, implications that it could be a wave. Okay, so what does the Maltese cross prove and also in which direction does the beam move? Now, if you want to go through these questions, uh, by all means, pause it first. Um, give yourselves a couple of seconds before you go on. I'm going to go through the answers now. So question B, the answer is B, travel in straight lines. And question C, out of the page is where the cathode beam goes. Okay. Next we have is the electric field. So the final thing is if it's a charged, if it's charged, it's a particle. That's that's what we know. Okay. Uh, only particles have charges. Okay. So the cathode rays bent towards the positive plate. If it bends towards the positive plate, that would imply that the cathode rays were negative and negative charged particles. Okay. Now, I put a little asterisk here saying initially nothing. So there was a little um, issue at the start when they did this particular experiment. Um, the vacuum of the tube wasn't uh, strong enough. So the air pressure wasn't um, low enough. And one of the issues with that is the electrons would interact with the atoms and move along instead of interacting with the charged plate. So 
the reason why there was initially nothing happening was just because the vacuum tube uh, didn't have a low enough air pressure to allow the electrons to move through uh, uninterrupted by the gases inside. But yeah, so this one proves that it's a negatively charged particle. Okay, so this is all the little summary points of little things we've talked about. Another thing we know is um, these electrons are essentially unaffected by gravity. You won't see a massive interaction. Um, they can pass through very thin pieces of metal. Remember, um, electrons are, you know, electrons can cause beta decay. So this bit here is more so with electrons doing beta decay. And if you remember, beta decay is a type of radioactive decay, so releasing radiation there, and it can produce fluorescence. So what the implication of this is showing you here is that most of the evidence shows that it's a particle and for quite a long time after JJ Thompson's experiment they did think of it or well, not that long after it was about 50 years um, they did think the electrons were just particles but what we actually do know now is uh, electrons is both a particle and both a wave now you might think of this being very familiar because that's the exact same thing what we said with light light being wave mostly and then having some particle like nature exact same thing for electrons it's mostly a particle and then depending on certain observations it does behave like a wave but we'll get into that a little bit more later okay so the next bit we're going to look at is uh, Thompson's charge to mass experiment. And as I said, um, if, the if this explanation gets a bit too long, we'll cut it into two parts.